We're going to continue talking about pharmacology, and we're going to discuss the autonomic nervous system, which consists of the parasympathetic and the sympathetic innervation. The parasympathetic nervous system is thought to come from the cranial and the sacral region of the spinal cord, and the sympathetic nervous system is thought to generate from the thoracolumbar region of the spinal cord. The parasympathetic innervation is thought to have the influence of rest and digest on the major organs versus the sympathetic tone generally has the fight and flight influence on the major organs, which we'll talk about later. The parasympathetic nervous system expresses itself, for example, through acetylcholine that binds to the cholinergic receptors such as the muscarinic and the nicotinic receptors which we'll discuss and the sympathetic nervous system manifests itself for example through norepinephrine which binds to the adrenergic receptors which we'll talk about later for example the alpha and beta receptors some characteristics that we'll mention now are the fibers that come off the spinal cord prior to the ganglion are considered the preganglionic fibers and we can see here that the parasympathetic preganglionic fiber is generally large, longer than the preganglionic fibers of the sympathetic nervous system and the fibers after the ganglion are considered the postganglionic fibers and we can say that the fibers or the postganglionic fibers of the parasympathetic nerves are shorter than the postganglionic fibers of the sympathetic nervous system. The similarities between the two systems is that at the ganglionic synaptic cleft or at the synapse at the ganglion of both the parasympathetic nerves and the sympathetic nerves both release acetylcholine. But the difference is at the nerve terminal of the postganglionic fibers in which the parasympathetic nervous system releases acetylcholine which binds to the muscarinic and the nicotinic receptors and the sympathetic postganglionic fibers release for example norepinephrine which binds to the adrenergic receptors such as the alpha and beta receptors. And an example would be the SA node. The SA node is located at the junction of the superior vena cava and the right atrium. And the SA node governs the rate and rhythm of the heart. And depending on which tone predominates, whether the, pre the parasympathetic tone or the sympathetic tone, dominating the influence on the SA node will govern whether the heart rate is going to be increased or decreased and whether there's going to be an increase in ionotropic effect on the ventricles. And an example that's illustrated down below here is the SA node. And we can see here that the cholinergic influence comes from the parasympathetic nervous system and the adrenergic influence comes from the sympathetic nervous system. And the cholinergic agonist, in which we'll use the example of acetylcholine, binds to the muscarinic receptor, which happens to be the M2 receptor on the SA node. And once the acetylcholine binds to the muscarinic receptor, that stimulates the GI protein, which inhibits the adenyl adenylcyclase enzyme, which decreases the production of cyclic AMP and has the ultimate result of decreasing the heart rate. So therefore, we can say that the parasympathetic tone on the SA node generally decreases the heart rate. And hence the suggested comment before that the parasympathetic tone creates the rest and digest influence on the end organs. So therefore, the heart's more at rest with a decreased heart rate under the parasympathetic nervous system tone. The opposite is true with the adrenergic influence from the sympathetic nervous system in which norepinephrine is released from the postganglionic nerve terminal of the sympathetic nervous system and binds to the beta-1 receptor of the SA node. And once the norepinephrine binds to the beta-1 receptor
This stimulates the GS protein, which in this case stimulates the adenylate cyclase enzyme and therefore increases the cyclic ANP. And when there's an increased cyclic ANP, this influence increases the chromotropic, dromotropic, and the ionotropic effects on the cardiovascular system. The chromotropic effect increases the heart rate by influencing the exchange of ions within the SA node, and that stimulates an increased depolarization, which therefore increases the heart rate. The dromotropic incre increases the conduction velocity within the Purkinje fibers, which also increases the rate of conduction and therefore the heart rate. And the ionotropic effect increases the contractility of the ventricles. And we'll talk about how that affects the hemodynamics in the preceding lectures. The next thing we'll talk about are the adrenergic receptors. For example, the alpha-1 receptor generally has the effect of the influence on the vascular smooth muscles. So, for example, phenylephrine happens to be the alpha-1 agonist. So when phenylephrine is given, that stimulates the alpha-1 receptor, which therefore stimulates the GQ protein, and that activates the phospholipase C enzyme. Phospholipase C converts the PIP2 into IP3 in the DAG. That increases the intracellular calcium concentration within the smooth muscle, and that stimulates the vascular smooth muscle contraction. So you're going to get vasoconstriction in your peripheral arterioles. And that increased peripheral vascular resistance or systemic vascular resistance is going to contribute to an increased mean arterial pressure. Because as we know from previous lectures, the, in the mean arterial pressure equals the cardiac output multiplied by the systemic vascular resistance. So by stimulating the alpha-1 receptor, increasing the systemic vascular resistance will ultimately help to increase the mean arterial pressure. And that's an example of how you would treat somebody with hypotension, is that you would try to stimulate their systemic vascular resistance and therefore treat the decreased blood pressure, which is considered hypotension, in order to bring it back to normal tensive area to maintain perfusion pressures to the vital organs. The alpha-2 receptors, which we'll talk about briefly here, helps to inhibit the sympathetic tone once the norepinephrine is released from the nerve terminals. The high concentration of norepinephrine within the synaptic cleft has a feedback mechanism that stimulates the alpha-2 receptors, which therefore inhibits the further release of other vesicles that contain norepinephrine and therefore has an autoregulatory mechanism. Beta-1 receptors, as we talked about before, are within the cardiovascular system, for example, at the SA node, and that helps with the chromotropic, which is the heart rate, the dromotropic, which is the conduction velocity, and the ionotropic effect, which is the contractility of the heart. And the beta-2 receptors, which we'll talk about more in detail later, are within the smooth muscles of the pulmonary airways or the respiratory airways. So, for example, stimulating the beta-2 receptors stimulates the bronchodilatation, which is relaxation of the smooth muscles of the respiratory airways. So we'll talk about all these receptors more in details, and we'll talk about the agonist and the antagonist of each of these receptors in greater detail. Agonist is considered a molecule that binds the receptor and stimulates a physiological response, and an antagonist, an antagonist is a molecule that binds to the receptor but does not have or does not generate a physiological response. And it can be considered a competitive antagonist if it actually binds to the active site of the receptor or a non-competitive antagonist if it binds somewhere else apart from the active site but yet still hinders other agonist molecules to bind to the receptor site and therefore acts as an antagonist.
and we'll talk about these in greater detail in the next lecture.